Um, one of the things we wanted to do to begin with is just give you a little insight into how we look at things as actuaries. So one of the main things we do is look at the solvency of the fund. So this specifically is about the DI Trust Fund. We're talking about the disability program here. We also look at the retirement fund as well. But this graph specifically is about DI. Um, what it shows you is the reserves of the program as a percent of the annual cost. So if you focus to begin with on the 1995 line, which is the black line sort of at the bottom, this is what we were projecting way back in 1995. So you can see that the reserves were low. They went up beginning in 1995 as tax rates increased. Um, you may remember there was a little bit of a reallocation in the OASI and DI tax rates at that time. So that led to reserves increasing, but then things started coming down. And back in 1995, we projected that the reserves would run out in 2016. Uh, meanwhile, move forward to 2008. That's sort of the aqua line at the very top. The economy was booming. Reserves went way up. You can see that we were projecting the reserves there to last all the way until 2026. So that shows you what difference the economy makes in the DI fund. Um, moving forward a little further, 2017 is the blue line that you can't really see. It's actually covered by the red line. Um, this is after the recession. So things started coming way back down. Um, luckily, Congress in 2015 um, reallocated the tax rates again for OASI and DI. So you can see that things were going way down. There was a reallocation, which brought things back up, and now things are projected to go down again. Um, the good news here, you can see a little bit of the blue line there, is um, in 2017, we were projecting reserves would run out in 2028. This year, in 2018, we're projecting that's extended out to 2032. And we'll get a little more into the reasons for that later. All right, another graph here. This one really splits out the income and the cost of the program as a percent of GDP over the years. Um, probably here what we want to focus on is the blue line, which is the cost of the program. You can see back in the 80s and 90s, the cost was relatively low. Um, that was when baby boomers were in their prime working ages. Most of them weren't really at prime disability ages yet, so they weren't, the cost was low. They weren't really in the disability program. However, as they aged, you can see that in the 2000s, that blue line shoots way up. Uh, the baby boomers, this large generation, really shifted into the disability prone ages, and the cost went up. Um, really, this line is mainly driven by the demographics, um, which you can see now the line is starting to go down somewhat. That's because these folks are really moving into retirement and smaller generations are following them. Um, going forward, you can see that we project things to be relatively stable. Of course, this is our projection. It's based on what we know so far. Um, no projection is guaranteed, and the one thing we can guarantee is that we will not be exactly right. Karen uh, mentioned you know, some of the experiences we had where the Congress had to do a couple of uh, reallocations of tax rates back in 94 and in 2015 in order to keep the DI reserves from depleting. But you can imagine that when we got into really just even prior to the prior to the very recent experience after the recession that a lot of people were worried about disability, about the reserves depleting, were worried about disability kind of coming off the rails. So there was a lot of concern in many, many quarters in the academic and the policy community about what's going on with disability. Uh, and a lot of people were doing, you know, the classic, when you see a trend, you get out your ruler, 
uh, and, and, and that doesn't always work so well. Uh, one of the things that had been observed was between 1980 and 2010, it was often cited there was a tripling in the number of people receiving disabled worker benefits under the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. Well, there was. So uh, part of the question was, why is this? Is the system out of control? Is, is, is it getting easier to get on disability? Well, so we sat back, and other people had done this. Other people have done more on this since. But one thing that we did, and we share this with some congressional testimonies, was to try to break down that 187% increase, roughly a tripling, uh, over time that occurred from 1980 to 2010. And it was pretty easy to sort of break this down in rough terms. You can do it a lot of different ways. We discovered that, well, first of all, gee, just the number of people in our population between 20 and 64 increased by 41 percent. So you would probably expect you might have a few more people on disability rolls if your basic insured population is going up, or that's even just the basic population in general. But there was another factor. There was another factor which is actually, a lot of people are familiar with this concept of the baby boom. The baby boomers were advancing at age, and we were getting a different age distribution in the population. That explained 38 percent of it. Uh, we also have another little thing, which is not a tiny detail, but something of significance. When we increased our normal retirement age by a year between 2000 and 2005, that meant that people, if they want to get a benefit at 62 for retirement, they're going to get less, but the same amount for disability. So maybe there's a little more impetus to go in for disability benefits. And also, people would stay on disability benefits to a higher age. So that also contributed about 4%. Uh, disability insured, we had a big increase over this period, especially for women. We're going to have some more on that uh, on, on a succeeding slide. Uh, uh, on numbers of people in our population, even not taking into account the increase in the age, uh, just the, the insured rates went up a lot. Uh, the recession of, uh, you know, starting out in late 2007 uh, uh, had, uh, had a big effect on the numbers through 2010, obviously. Uh, and then also, incidence rates themselves grew some over time for lots of interesting reasons. Uh, so all of these things we felt kind of pretty much explained what was going on. Ergo, we shouldn't worry too much about the system really coming off the rails. It was just a matter of following the demographics. Uh, as Karen indicated back in 1990. Five, we had projected reserve depletion in 2016, which is where we were back at at the time of the last reallocation. So there, there was perhaps some pretty lucky guesses there. Now, we're going to talk through a little bit some of the components of what happened historically. I'll grab the first one. Karen's going to get some after that. But this is this sort of age distribution or redistribution of the population. We sort of like this graph. This takes the, what, 25 and older population in the U.S. going back to 1940 and forward and looks at it over time. And if you look at uh, the green on the bottom and then the pinkish, uh, well, green and I, it's orange over there, it's pinkish here. So uh, those, those, the bottom two you know, segments are the under 65, the working age population. Well, we broke down the working age population into over and under 45 because, as most of you know, the disabled workers tend to be much more likely to be in the over 45 than the under 45, much, much higher prevalence and incidence rates at those levels. So you can see between 1970 and 1990, Wow, the, the share of the working age population that was in disability prone ages was really getting small. Not a big surprise that disability wasn't seen to be a huge problem then. Between 1990 and 2010, amazing. Uh, as the baby boomers shifted into that age band, 45 to 64, we had a big increase in the number of people on disability roles. Really not a, a, a big problem in understanding that. But the fun part is as we look into the future, we're going to have rough stability. I mean, the under 65 is a shrinking share, as we all know, of the, of the, working, of, of the population over 25. But the share that's in the disability prone ages is going to be fairly stable in the future. And of course, we've known these demographics for a long, long time. This wasn't something we suddenly discovered in 2010 or 2012. So we were able to make uh, projections uh, along these lines. And the one comment I'd want to make about this is, on the last panel, the second slide that was shown had the, the wonderful Burkhauser Daily uh, slide about prevalence rates across different countries. Please keep in mind when you look at that slide, those are gross prevalence rates. The total number of disabled workers divided by the working age population, those are not age adjusted. You know, we, we love age adjusted charts because if you had those same charts on age adjusted basis, as we had more and more working age population move to the higher ages, you'd see the disability prevalence rates not increasing to the extent it appeared in those charts. So two things to take away from this slide. This is showing the percent of the population ages 15 to NRA 
that are insured for disability. So these are the folks who have worked enough and worked recently enough to be able to get disability benefits. Um, the males, you can see in, those rates have gone down a little bit. We're projecting those to stay level in the future. But the real thing to notice here is the increase in the female insured rates. Um, they have gone way up from about 38% back in 1970 to closer to 70% today. What that means is that women are working more and more steadily, so they're able to get these benefits. So no real surprise that more women are ending up on the disability rolls. Um, similarly, these are, these are incidence rates. So these are people coming on to the disability rolls. And as Steve mentioned, these are age adjusted. We like to do things age adjusted so that they're consistent and comparable across time. Otherwise, you get demographic effects in there that can skew things up one way or the other. Um, again, a little hard to see here, but this begins in 1970. There was a gap between the male rates, which are the blue rates, and the female rates, which are red. Um, but that gap has really closed since about 2000. Um, we are in the future expecting female rates to be just slightly lower than male rates going forward. Another little bit of historical perspective on this is that one of the challenges back then was when the recession came, my gosh, disability costs went way up as a percentage of GDP. And we thought, well, you know, it's probably good to look at both components of that ratio. Uh, and you can see on the Okay, white blue lines to the right, uh, that is the increase in the DI cost, uh, benefit cost as a percentage of GDP between 2008, just before the, when the recession was only getting started and didn't really affect our disability cost yet, uh, and 2013 when we would really basically felt uh, all the worst effects of the last Great Recession. And you can see we had a pretty big increase in DI cost as a percentage of GDP. But where did that come from? Well, the far left uh, little line here, which is for you, bright pink, uh, is, the, uh, is the decrease, or I'm sorry, the increase in the benefit cost as a percentage uh, for disability. Uh, and you can see, well, in 2010, we had a pretty big increase from in, in disability costs. But by 2013, you know, we, we didn't have, uh, we, we had like really virtually no increase in disability cost. However, what really affected the cost of disability as a percentage of GDP was the denominator. The fact that GDP, in fact, slowed down. We have another slide, not here, that actually shows uh, the change in number of workers and the change in number of beneficiaries. And it's much like this, but even more stark. So uh, we just wanted to point out that when there's a recession, it's not so much a matter of we have enormously large numbers of extra people getting benefits, but our tax base goes down. And that really affects our cost as percentage of GDP and payroll. Now, one other thing, now flipping a little bit, uh, I think the balance of what we're going to be talking about is largely now going to be going to the future as Jeff sort of foresaw. Uh, and, and what you're going to see on some of these remaining slides are going to be what has really happened in the more recent experience, which we are seeking to better understand and looking for cards and letters and, uh, and, and comments from you all to, to help us move in that direction. Applications and incidence rates have been dropping ever since the peak in 2010 uh, to quite a dramatic degree. Numbers of beneficiaries, which people were so worried about just a few years ago, have actually been declining since 2013. Prevalence rates have peaked and are, are dropping. Now, here's the question about the future. Uh, are the declines we're seeing here recently, are these temporary? Or are we moving to a new level, a new situation with disability? Uh, a bunch of possibilities we've looked at is, well, the economy and jobs. That suggests that you know, with, a, with a returning strong economy, this should be temporary, or, or is it? Has there been a change in the nature of employment in our country? Uh, drop in hearings allowances. Probably most are familiar that our administrative law judge hearings allowance rates have dropped from you know in the mid 60s to maybe more like the mid 40 percent uh, in recent years for perhaps a number of reasons. Uh, some have suggested uh, the Affordable Care Act bringing more health insurance, more access to health care to uh, many millions of people who didn't have insurance before. Maybe it's kept a bunch of people who might have been on the verge of applying for disability healthier, longer, and therefore they're not applying as much. Uh, there's been some work uh, by some people in this room about things, uh, field office consolidations. Some have suggested by uh, reduction in the number of field offices and consolidating them uh, by SSA that perhaps uh, we've, uh, that's contributed towards the lesser applications we've gotten. Uh, 
Some people have talked about attorney representation. In fact, in particular, one very large law firm went out of business a few years back. Uh, and there was concern that maybe their stoppage of their national advertising uh, was not getting the word out about you comply for disability benefits. From we've been hearing, hearing from people though, is that most of the attorneys that were working that are still working in that area and might be uh, advertising at least as effectively as before now on a, on a regional basis. Uh, and the other question is, is there something more fundamental? going on here, and that's what we, we, we seek to better understand. Uh, we're gonna be searching for it, and again, as I said, looking for more input from you all uh, about getting to better understand it. This graph is really about the numbers of disability applications we've been seeing at Social Security. So you can see that back in 2007, which was basically the peak of the last economic cycle, Applications were pretty low. They were on the order of 1.6 um, million. Um, oh, oops, sorry about that. All right, during the recession, um, applications kicked way up, increased rapidly to over 2 million in 2010. Um, what you can see from there is that in each successive trustees report, we keep projecting the number of applications to level off or get back to where they were before. Every year we've been wrong. Applications since 2010 have dropped dramatically, as you can see. They're now below 1.5 million. Um, even when we think the economy is really um, you know, back to about the level it was in 2007, maybe not, that's a little bit debatable. Um, but really applications are at an all time low level. And even in 2018, they're still down. Um, again, in the 2018 trustees report, we projected them to start jumping back up, but they haven't, they're still down. Now this is a estimate based on data through mid-June. So it's, it's always possible things will come back before the end of the year, but it's not looking good. Or it is looking good. We want fewer disability applications, right? Um, moving on to the incidence rate. Um, I explained before, this is really the number of people going on the rolls. So this relates directly to disability awards, people who are actually awarded disability benefits. Um, the picture is very similar to the applications one. Um, things were low, moved up very high in the recession, have plummeted since then. Um, one thing to note is that the 2018 number actually has jumped up a little bit. Um, so that, that's a bit of a good news story. Um, this is actually related to the Social Security Administration working down the disability backlog. So um, we're starting to really work through some of those older cases so more people are getting on the rolls. Um, this, this graph is basically the last one, but zooming in on the recent history and the near term. So the blue line is exactly what you saw in the previous graph. This is our projection for the 2018 trustees report. The little red line there shows what would have happened if we weren't assuming any reduction in the backlog. So you can see that the line is very smooth if there were no reduction in backlog, but we're actually expecting those judges to um, make more decisions and get more people on the rolls. Um, one other interesting thing we noticed this year when going through our projections was that, let me make sure I've got this straight, I always get the sign wrong, Folks getting awarded at the hearings level actually have significantly lower benefits on average than those awarded initially. So because we're working down that backlog, the average benefit overall is lower than we would have expected it to be. So a little interesting quirk that happened this year. Um, so putting this all together, what does this mean? We have lower applications, we have lower awards. Obviously that leads into lower numbers of beneficiaries overall. 
Um, the black line on this graph is what we were projecting in the 2008 trustees report. This is before we had incorporated any recession effects into our projections. So you can see we were sort of projecting the roles to pretty steadily go up and then eventually level off. Um, in fact, what we saw, um, again, the blue and the red lines are sort of overlapping each other in the historical period, but what we saw was that more people came on the rolls during the recession, but significantly fewer since then. So it actually brings the overall number of beneficiaries down in the projection period. Um, 2008 projections are even, I'm sorry, 2018 projections are even lower than in 17. So uh, one other just a little add a little piece I just want to add on to the, to the really interesting point that Karen made about administrative law judge allowances tended to have monthly benefits about 10% lower than those that are allowed earlier at the disability determination services. That's actually been consistent over the last several years. Uh, and, and the way this really affected our, our projections is when we discovered this, we saw over the last three, four years during which the administrative law judge allowances were relatively smaller than usual share, that therefore tended to make our average awarded benefit amount elevated from what it should really have been. So in this year, where we're starting to get the backlog down, we had a more normal in 2017 relationship between the number of allowances at administrative law judge versus disability determination services that brought down the average awarded benefit level from what we would have otherwise expected and takes us to actually a lower state for future years going forward. So it really did have a, a somewhat significant effect. This slide, we don't really spend a lot of time on. I think most of you are sort of familiar with this, sort of takes a little bit more of an historical expect perspective uh, of what you can see with the, uh, the blue here is our age sex suggested disability incidence rate going back to 1970, it moves up and down not surprisingly uh, roughly in consonance with what's going on with the unemployment rate. Uh, so, uh, you know, with the recessions. But again, what we're dealing with now at this point is something that is sort of beyond what we would have been expecting from recessions as shown in some of the earlier slides. Uh, just, just wanted to point out also in terms of disability prevalence rates, this is almost back to the point earlier where we had the, you know, to almost 200% increase between 1980 and 2010 in the number of disabled workers. Uh, the prevalence rates went up somewhat during that period of time. In the future, we're projecting prevalence rates to be uh, about the same. However, uh, we're, we're showing prevalence rates to be going up a little bit in the future. This will be contingent on what really happens with the incidence rates in the future. If we are now moved down to a permanently lower level of incidence rates than the level that we are currently still assuming for the ultimate level, which is quite a bit above what we've had very recently, uh, then these prevalence rates are being overestimated now. Time will tell. Uh, and to that point, just wanted to share with you, uh, because prevalence rates and our numbers of beneficiaries will be determined by what happens with incidence rates, we wanted to share with you on the little red with the little, little red dots, these are the ultimate disability incidence rates per thousand. It's on, a, uh, on an age-adjusted basis, of course, that we've had over the last several trustees reports. You can see, and I think it was the 2012 trustees report, we jumped from about a 5.2 up to a 5.4 level based on recent experience and lots of people concerned about disability. Uh, maybe not the smartest move in the world, we did that. But you can see also on the other uh, little lines here, the solid lines, you can see over the past 10, 20, and 30 years, historical moving averages, what has been happening. What's interesting is while the numbers, especially for the 10-year average, you can see went way up. It was at a high level back in 2012, sort of the impetus for people thinking maybe we're going to have a permanently higher level. Uh, the 20-year and 30-year had not been so high at those points, and all now have moved down and converged 10, 20, and 30-year histories to about a 5.2 level, which begs the question of where do we expect to be, where do we think we will be in the future? Are we in a temporary little lull here on disability incidence rates and it's going to come back up, uh, or are we in a quasi-new normal? So I'm going to talk a bit about this uh, decline in SSDI awards, which I think is really the biggest, uh, a really, really big deal. It was um, a bit unexpected, and uh, it, it is kind of, in some ways, the biggest thing to happen in the DI program in uh, recent memory. And um, what I'll do is offer my thoughts on what those uh, reasons for the decline might be, 
implications for research and kind of give you my opinion about what the future outlook is. Will we, is this sort of the new normal or are we gonna kind of revert back to the prior? So um, if I had to tell you what were the kind of the three big things that are driving this decline in DI awards, um, these, this is what I would pick. I would say demographics, the economy, and then SSA policy, and by that I mean this ALJ reform um, of the hearing level and the ways in which administrative law judges, ALJs, make their and document their decisions. I'm going to focus on the latter two, the economy and the ALJ reforms, in part because they're, they're rather intertwined and I think you need to kind of get a handle on both of those to really understand what's been happening here and what's going to happen in the future. Demographics are also important, and I think Steve and um, Karen made, uh, kind of show that very clearly, the power of demographics here. They're also not as hard to understand because they're somewhat predictable. So starting with the economy, we've known for some time that SSDI applications are counter-cyclical. This is a picture uh, produced by uh, Kathleen Mullen and Alexi Strand and I, um, looking at the Great Recession. And just like in prior recessions, you see that as the unemployment rate spiked up in the Great Recession, we're showing here the monthly unemployment rate um, in blue, so did the number of disability claims. So the Great Recession was really, uh, in some ways, no different than prior recessions in that regard. Um, and here we're showing the number of claims relative to their baseline level. So the system was getting about 120,000 disability claims per month prior to the recession, and that rose by about 20 to 30,000 additional claims as the recession progressed. But what we didn't know is, did this translate to awards in quite the same way? And that was because we hadn't yet been able to follow recession-induced claims over time to track how many of them eventually, often many years later, get awarded. And so that's what we did. And you see here, when you organize those claims by the date at which they were filed and relate that to the unemployment rate, you see that also awards spiked with the Great Recession as well. Now, in, in the paper here, we um, <coughs> used the fact that the recession played out differently into different degrees of intensity, different timings across different states. So we use a state month variation in the unemployment rate to estimate the elasticities underlying here. Um, and we found that the elasticity of application with respect to unemployment was 0.25. So with that, to get a sense of that magnitude, at the peak of the recession, when the unemployment rate had, had doubled, the system was getting about 25% more applications that month than usual. It was also getting more awards, about 19% more awards than usual. We calculate using these estimates that the recession led about 1.4 million workers to apply for disability benefits. About a million of those were new, in the sense that had there been no recession, they probably wouldn't have applied. But a sizable chunk, about 28%, would have applied anyway. And we, got, we obtained this finding by estimating the, dy the dynamics of this effect. They would have applied anyway, but only a few months later. So what that implies is that it is not the case that the reason we have such low applications now is because they were all shifted forward in time during the Great Recession. And in fact, the same pattern exists in awards. There were over 500,000 induced awardees. About 400,000 of them probably wouldn't have come in had economic times been better, but 100,000 of them would have come in anyway just a little bit later in time, only one to two months later. Now, what's as big as these effects are, and they are big and they've had important cost implications for the system, in the scheme of things, those induced applications were only 11.6% of all applications that were received by the disability system at that time, between, say, 2008 and 2012. And the induced awards were only 8.9% of all the awards made to applicants during this time period. So the recession was important, but it can't possibly really be a major um, explanatory factor behind the decline in the award rates. It's going to play a role, and it plays an important role, and I'm going to show you how it affects the award rate. The key thing being that recession-induced applicants are, of course, a little bit healthier than the average applicant. Um, so one other fact that I think is useful to keep in mind in thinking about, well, what happens when the economy um, takes another downturn? What's going to happen here? 
So the Great Recession actually had relatively little impact on, on the initial award rate. The disability examiners on the initial review didn't change their behavior very much. But the appellate wards increased by a lot. Actually, they, they increased at both reconsideration and at the hearings level. And so as a result, about 53, more than half of the induced recession-induced beneficiaries were allowed on appeal, much higher than what you usually find in a typical year, which is more like 37% of beneficiaries being allowed on appeal. So the important thing here is that the administrative law judges were particularly influential in driving the effect of the Great Recession on the DI um, application or DI award rate. Um, and it is true also, this was the fourth point here, that the induced applicants had less severe impairments than average. Their allowance rate was actually only 42% compared to an average of about 54% in these data. So it is also interesting to consider what has been happening then to employment. And so there has been a very kind of corroborating um, the, the significance of these um, business cycle effects. There has been a very, very interesting recent turnaround in the employment of people with disabilities. Here I'm plotting, um, focus on the colored lines here. The orange line is data from the ACS. Um, the blue line is from the CPS. The gray bars show the last two recessions and we're looking at the employment rate uh, measured in those survey data sets of people with disabilities. Disability is defined by those, um, that six question uh, disability sequence. And you see that um, as, as with the retirement programs, employment declined and declined for many, many years. And then in the mid 90s, we saw a turnaround in employment. We're seeing a very similar kind of turnaround in the employment of people with disabilities occurring in about, well, 2014. Um, if you drill in to the monthly data and look at men and women, separately, the, the orange line at the top is men, the red line at the bottom is women, and here we're showing the monthly jobs data from 2008 to 2000, June 2018, and the, the, it's, it's, it's actually quite pronounced, and that increases on the order of about five percentage points, and that's a relatively uh, large gain in employment compared to the base uh, employment rate for this group, which you know, hovers in the mid-20s to mid-30s. Okay. So on to SSA policy. The ALJ hearing reforms, I think, are a much bigger deal than the business cycle, and possibly the most important and least heralded, least discussed, least understood um, SSDI policy reform of our time. So what did SSA do? The Appeals Council used data analytics to identify ALJs who were making non-policy compliant decisions. And what that, meant, what that meant was that it turns out there's something like 2,000 different outcomes of a disability case that can be entered into the record. And for many of those outcomes, there is um, decision tree pathing that needs to be followed. So if you want to allow somebody on a particular basis, you need to, that, that applicant has to satisfy, say, three tests. And if they pass the three tests, then you can provide that, you can uh, award on that basis. What they found was that many ALJs were not following the decision trees. And so using their data analytic tools, they were able to identify those ALJs and give them feedback. They were also able to identify the ALJs who had outlier allowance rates. Either they weren't, they were allowing uh, statistically far too many cases, statistically far too few cases. They gave feedback to those as well. Um, as a result, new training for ALJs was introduced in 2011, and the training focused on policy compliant decision making and ensuring that the ALJs were actually documenting all the required regulatory steps into the, into the judicial record. They also simultaneously hired many, many new ALJs into the system, and all of the new ALJs were immediately trained under the new system beginning in 2011. What you have then is massive turnover in the judicial core and also retraining of all the incumbents and the new entrants. Hillary Hoynes, uh, Alexi Strand, and I are, have been digging into this, trying to understand the nature of these reforms. And so far what we're finding is that the ALJs who stayed, that is, they didn't retire, um, 
they had actually lower pre-period allowance rates than the, the ones who left. The new ALJs had substantially lower allowance rates than the ones who left by as much as we're finding seven percentage points lower. Um, and um, even the peers, of, there are even kind of interesting spillover effects. The judges that were targeted for feedback, that when that occurred, if a judge in your office had, been, had received this feedback, then um, the other judges in the office also reacted by reducing their allowance rate. So we're still trying to parse out these effects and um, understand how, well, how, how much of that decline in the hearing level allowance rate could this possibly um, explain, but we think it has the potential to account for a pretty sizable share of the decline in the hearing allowance rate, simply because um, so many of these judges were treated. I think if you look at the judicial core today, um, post-2011, it is a very, very different uh, core than it was in, uh, before that time, both in terms of the people deciding decisions, but also the ways in which they're making these decisions. Here, um, this, what this is showing, so this is kind of putting these two things together. Um, this is back to the, um, the study with uh, Kathleen Mullen and Alexi Strand. And you can see why it's been kind of difficult to sort out um, you know, what's due to the reforms at the, uh, at the ALJ level versus the Great Recession. And what we've done here is show in blue what the actual hearing level allowance rate has been since 2007. Um, for, well, these are applications filed in 2007, so the allowance rate itself is playing out, um, you know, it is coming from allowances made in, in future dates all the way through uh, 2013. And then we use our estimates from the other, from the other work to kind of net out all of those recession-induced applications and awards to compute a counterfactual allowance rate. So what would have been the allowance rate had we not had the Great Recession? And what you see is that the allowance rate would have stayed relatively high and flat until about the applications that were filed in 2010, which hit the, the hearing level in about 2011 when they rolled out these reforms. And then it comes down, and it comes down quickly and sharply. But with the recession-induced applicants in the mix, recall that these people had lower allowance rates because they were healthier than your average applicant. It was, it's been very, very hard to really say, well, could it possibly have been these ALJ reforms or not? So there's more to do here, of course, to try to figure out, well, how much can we really attribute of that decline in the um, hearing level award rate to uh, the specific ALJ reforms, but I think we're making some good progress on that. Okay, so I think um, this set of findings offers up a number of implications. For one, internal policy changes can make a really, really big difference. There was no act of Congress that um, changed, uh, like, changed the screening level of the disability system, and yet we have seen what amounts to about a 20 percentage point reduction in the hearing level allowance rate. So that's the first thing. Two, many people with disabilities appear to have work capacity. Um, in other work, we found that about 40 percent of SSDI applicants have some degree of work capacity. And what this suggests to me is that we just need better measurement of the specific work capacities that people have and better linkage of those specific work capacities to the specific <coughs> demands of jobs. At this point, our system is rather, um, rather uh, blunt. I think we know a lot more about what jobs demand, and we're much far more capable of measuring work capacity than we've been able to in the past. Three, increasingly, people with disabilities are working, and for many people, work is an alternative to SSDI um, participation. Um, I think one implication of the economic business cycle effects that you see with respect to the disability program and also this, later, this latest increase in, in employment by people with disabilities is that people with disabilities benefit from excess labor demand. When the labor markets are tight, they work. <laughs> Employers hire them. Um, and I think these demand pressures are likely to continue as population aging intensifies. Population aging itself will just put more pressure on the labor market as labor force growth slows. Fourth, it suggests that there is a need for greater understanding of the employer role. We tend to, I think research to date has really largely focused on the, quote, moral hazard problem of the applicant, 
But there is also a possible moral hazard problem on the employer side. That is that employers don't fully internalize the cost of not accommodating somebody who has a disability and instead allow them to just um, to go on to the SSDI program. Um, we have begun digging into this. This is a, it's been rather hard to study because we, did, we don't have data that links um, um, kind of the characteristics of the firms that people come from um, in a very kind of easily uh, accessible way. Um, but what we do observe, and we've turned to IRS data to do this, large differences across industries in the DI entry rates of formal workers. And here's just a little picture from this work, which is a, a little bit, um, a little hard to read, but let me tell you what you're seeing. Um, what we're graphing here is the SSDI entry rate of former workers by industry. And so you see quite a lot of variation. The top industry for sending workers to the DI program, so these are people who are working three years prior and are observed to be receiving disability benefits three years later. Mining is the number one at 1.86% of former mining workers enrolling in SSDI benefits, followed by transportation, um, management of companies, administrative support, construction, healthcare, all the way down to a low of, educa of, of 0.77 for educational services. That's a variation of more than twofold in these DI entry rates across industries. And now you might say, well, mining, you know, of course it's mining on top. But there are some surprises in here. For example, management of companies, that's the number three at 1.7%. That comprise, the top occupations in that industry are things like bookkeepers, managers, um, accountants, um, administrative and support also has, um, you know, it, it, it has a range of managerial um, and janitorial kinds of positions. Construction, of course, you might expect to see that. Um, but it turns out actually that much of our, our intuition about which industries should be on this list is formed by what we know about injury rates from the workers' compensation systems. And we've done a little bit of arraying those against this list, and um, it, they, it's, it, this is not going to be a perfect correlation at all. And of course, that makes sense. We have a workers' compensation system to handle those. Um, DI claims are not necessarily work-related. They can be, but they're, they're not always. So in the future, I expect that some of these employment gains could be reversed during the next downturn. But I think there will be less impact um, of a future recession on the SSDI program, in part because of these appellate reforms. Recall that the, the, the hearing level, the appellate system, was really um, a big factor in driving the number of people who came onto the program during the Great Recession. Um, and that really, I think, um, has, has changed. Um, this improvement in judicial de decision making, I think, is, is a permanent change. The, literally, the, you know, the, the humans making the decisions are largely different. There are all kinds of new, um, new uh, uh, kind of um, data quality analytic tools that have been deployed to both improve the consistency of decision making across the decisions and um, also help um, measure and track productivity of the workforce. Um, and the question of attorneys always comes up, and there was a very prominent uh, bankruptcy of the firm Binder & Binder um, a few years ago. And, um, and so some have speculated that perhaps uh, the reduction in attorney activity could, be, uh, could, be, could have something to do with the decline in award rates. But um, um, this, I think, is actually um, a consequence of the change in the hearing level allowance rate and not the cause of it. And if you think about it, when the award rate declines, attorneys uh, lose money. They're less likely to get compensated on cases since they're compensated only if they win. Okay. Um, so lastly, I do think we should see some benefits of technological progress in the future. That, it, that should make it easier for some people with disabilities to work. But this too is an area where we simply need far more research and investigation to understand how that is playing out and how it might play out in the future as automation continues to increase. Thank you. I want to make uh, three points. Uh, the first is that um, 
it's pretty remarkable how stable DI incidence rates uh, and uh, DI spending as a share of GDP have been once you uh, adjust for the business cycle over the last 25 years. That's going to be the first point I'm going to make. The second is that stability masks big offsetting cha changes in both cases. It's almost, it's more a coincidence than some natural feature of the program. And so it means that I think looking forward, if some of the big forces that have been in going in offsetting directions, one turns out to go faster than the other, we wouldn't necessarily expect that kind of stability uh, go going forward. Uh, and third, uh, I'm gonna agree with Nicole about the importance of uh, policy implementation uh, and, and, and present some, 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 some findings in that direction. Um, so uh, these are two pictures from my 2015 uh, Journal of Economic Perspectives um, piece, and they, they show uh, the incidence of disability insurance, meaning the percentage of eligible workers who were awarded benefits in, in, in each year. And as has come up uh, several times, those, it, it, it's, it's uh, tricky to look at the raw numbers because the age distribution is changing and because uh, of, of business cycle effects. And what happens in the right uh, graph on the right is uh, there I have taken out, uh, I, I've age adjusted, uh, and I've also uh, controlled for the unemployment rate and the lagged of the un unemployment rate within, within five year age, age ranges. And what you can see is there were these big policy reforms that first tightened eligibility uh, and then loosened them again uh, in, in the 80s. But since about 1990, male incidence has been incredibly flat um, once you take out the business cycle uh, effect. Um, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's a, a, you know, a 20, uh, you know, we, we, have, we, have, we have about a 20, 25 year period now, if you, if you look at the later data that, that's, that uh, the actuaries put forward, where the instance rate, if you, regression, if you uh, adjust for the business cycle, ha has been incredibly flat. Um, that, that downturn at the, in 2010 is interesting. That's showing that the take up of DI during the Great Recession was lower than we would have expected based on previous relationships between unemployment rate. And in other words, the, the cyclical sensitivity was less than we would expect, which I think is consistent with Nicole's evidence that something else was going on there. So, you know, I wrote this paper before any, I knew anything at least about any of this ALJ stuff, but something, we already knew something needed to be explained there. Uh, and, and I think Nicole has probably just explained it uh, uh, for us, uh, which is some, something happened that offset the, the normal rise and take up, partially offset it during, during, during the recession. Uh, for, for women, uh, women uh, in, in a data sense have been converging toward men. I, I don't want to argue that that's a literal, that's literally what's going on, but because there, there are different health conditions uh, um, going on here. But, but the, the basic trend here has been that uh, in this period where male incidence was completely constant during the 90s, female incidence was converging just numerically toward, toward the male incidence rate, and one of the remarkable things in, in um, Stephen Karen's slides that uh, I don't think they highlighted, but were, were are in the slides, if you, if you like me, got, to, got a sneak peek ahead of time, is that actually male and female incidence uh, are now equal for the first time. The female have fully, have fully caught up, and, 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 and that, that is a, uh, I don't know, I guess that's a milestone that, that means something. Um, um, okay, so we had this incredible uh, stability here. The, the other thing that's been incredibly stable has been spending on DI as a share of uh, GDP. Um, and, um, or, or, or more accurately, spending for males has been incredibly uh, constant, and then for females, as they enter the labor force and become more eligible, it's, it's, it's risen a bit. So here is a figure, the, the darker band there, uh, the, the darker part at the bottom are, is, is male spending on, DI spending on male benefits as a percent of GDP. This isn't adjusted for anything. This is just the absolute spending. And you can see it was 0.4 of GDP in, in the late 70s, 1980. Uh, it was 0.4 of GDP on the, on the, on the verge of the Great Recession. Uh, female spending has been going up as more females have been in the labor force and, and, and covered. Uh, here, here this is in, in, in numbers. Uh, you can see uh, the, the average in the late 70s, 0.41. The average in, in uh, right before the recession, 0.41. Uh, totals gone up uh, from point, you know, less than one, about half a percent of GDP to 0.68 percent of uh, GDP on the verge of the recession. During the recession, with the with the cyclical increase in claiming, uh, spending went up to 0.87 percent uh, of GDP. It's already come down to 0.74 as 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 the economy has recovered, and the actuaries are, are predicting that we're back to the pre-recession level of spending at at, at 0.69. So. You know, over this period, if you go back to, to 1980, so we're, we're, we're going over you know, a, a close to 40 year period, uh, the total increase in spending on this program um, uh, is about 
you know, it's, it's under 0.2% of GDP. If you think of spending on Medicare and Medicaid, that goes up by 0.2 of GDP every two years. And that's the you know, total over 40 years here. So the, 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 there's, there's no fiscal issue here. There's, there, you know, this, is, this is a very, uh, it's gone up a bit as women enter the labor force, but otherwise it's been constant. All right, so, so const, fairly constant incidence, um, um, fairly constant uh, spending, but I want to argue that both of those are almost a coincidence and not some fundamental um, uh, entity here. So first of all, um, if you think about the, the, the constant incidence of, um, of, 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 of male claiming of, of male receipt of DI benefits, uh, what's happened is there's been a lot of health improvements in some conditions, like circulatory conditions, uh, also true in, 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 in cancer-related conditions, and there's been an incredible increase in, in musculoskeletal. Those have just happened to cancel. And you know, if one had grown faster than the other, we wouldn't be talking about constant incidence. We'd be talking about it rising. Now, some of it could be, you know, there are people who, for a variety of reasons, their work is pretty crummy. They've got a bunch of chronic health conditions. They're claiming one thing versus the other because it's be, you know, become easier to claim one versus the other. And so maybe some of it is an offset of the same people. But, but some of this has got to be just a sort of coincidence that the, the sign of one health trend and the other happened to, to, to cancel. And so as we see things like incidence being surprisingly low the last few years, I think it's worth us starting to look to see if some of these health trends are no longer canceling. You know, maybe the increase in, in musculoskeletal conditions or, or, or uh, mental health conditions has leveled off and we're still getting some of the other in, uh, decreases happening. Or think, I mean, we should, that, there's, there's, that, that could easily be part of the story that we should start looking for in the data when, if you have the more uh, dis, disaggregated story. So, so I would argue the incidence uh, um, uh, the, 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 the near constancy of incidence is, is sort of a, a coincidence from two big offsetting changes. And, and that's sort of true in the GDP numbers as well. So the, the spending as a share of GDP is, of course, the product of the number of people getting benefits and the average benefit rate. The, 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 spending, isn't, the spending numbers aren't, aren't uh, uh, age adjusted. So you'd expect, we, you know, we know the baby boomers all hit this, this, the high disability age. Uh, why didn't we see spending go up? proportional to the number of, of beneficiaries going up. And the answer is that the average benefit relative to GDP has come down uh, quite considerably. And the reason for that is one, uh, income inequality. So the earnings level of uh, a typical DI beneficiary relative to the overall earnings level has been going down. Secondly, the, the earnings share of compensation has been going down as health benefits are a bigger share of uh, uh, compensation. And third, worker compensation as a share of GDP has been going down. And for all three of those reasons, benefit levels relative to GDP have fallen by enough to offset that the, the increase in recipients as a share of GDP, uh, and, and that's led to sort of the this, this stability on, on, on spending. Again, there's no reason why, I mean, I, I think we, we know from the demographics that the number of beneficiaries is sort of going to be pretty constant. Um, but there's no, no particular reason to think we're going to continue to have a decline in benefits relative to GDP. That could change if, if trends, in, trends in inequality or in worker bar, bargaining, power, bargaining power changed over time. And so that feature of the stability you know, might, 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 might not persist. Um, okay, uh, third thing I guess I wanted to point out is uh, going, going back here, you know, the, the, you know uh, Stephen Karen pointed out that the incidence rates of the last few years, which are down at about 4.2%, are really off the charts compared to anything we've experienced recently. Now, when you look at those numbers, you have to adjust for the fact that we're at a strong part of the business cycle. So if you adjusted, that would sort of be sort of more like 4.7 or 4.8 if you, if you increase them to the average point in the business cycle, but they're still gonna be really, they're, 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 still, um, uh, uh, they're still quite low, which I think uh, is, 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 is certainly evidence that something has happened in the, in the um, uh, something beyond the business cycle has happened during, during this period, which, which in part is the ALJ story, but maybe something else going on as well that we, that we haven't all discovered yet. Um, I, I think it's illustrative to compare what we've seen uh, during and in the aftermath of the Great Recession to DI claims to what we've seen with uh, SNAP food stamp claims. So for, for SNAP, um, basically there was a big uptake in benefits that was exactly what you would have predicted based on the relationship between previous, uh, during previous recessions between SNAP um, take up and uh, the unemployment rate. Uh, 
Um, so uh, unlike DI, DI, where there was a muted re response, in SNAP it was basically in line with past um, claiming behavior. Um, but uh, as, the re as, we've, as we've recovered for the recession, uh, SNAP has not come down nearly as fast as we would have expected based on past recessions. And you can see here that you know, the SNAP receipt went from 8.7% of the US population up to 15% at the peak of the recession, and now it's come down only about halfway to, to, to about uh, 12%. Um, you know, whereas we saw DI come down further than we would have predicted based on, on, on past re recessions to, to, a, to, a, you know, to what is, a, at least in modern history, a record low uh, in, in incidence rate. Um, I, I, my, my best guess of what's going on differently here actually is, is uh, reinforces Nicole's story that policy implementation matters. So during the, um, during the second Bush administration, during the 2000s, there was a deliberate policy initiative to make it easier for the working poor who were eligible for SNAP to receive benefits. And so in particular, it used to be that if you wanted to go get benefits uh, and after you were signed up, um, you'd have to take a day off from work to go recertify every few months. And that wasn't really plus plausible for a lot of people that, that, you know, to, to do that, and people would get cycle off of benefits. And they did things like, say, you can just call on the phone to recertify rather than have to leave work and show up in the welfare office to do it. And more recently, you can now apply for benefits completely uh, online in most, um, in, 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 in most states. And so I'm guessing that the continuation of those it's again, it's the policy implementation story. The making it easier for the working poor to stay uh, uh, signed up for, for SNAP is, is part of the, it's, is again, so this, there's this underlying increased ease of, of application uh, that, that's been going on over this period that's sort of happening at the same time as the business cycle and, and those two things combined are explaining why uh, you know, we, we have a different pattern over the cycle than, 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 than we would have expected. Um, final uh, observation um, uh, I'd like to make is that, you know, I think it's been, th there are a lot of things in the, in the USDI system where um, the incentives are not uh, perfectly aligned. And uh, Nicole referred to the employer situation. Uh, you know, clearly there are incentives that, that affect uh, individuals and their application decisions. Uh, there's, there's screwy things in uh, the way the SSA budget is designed such that um, the, 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 the funds that are spent um, to figure out whether people should get benefits are on the discretionary side of the budget, which is capped, uh, and so, but then the benefits are on the uh, uncapped um, entitlement side of the budget, and so uh, if you underspend on SSA administrative capacity, uh, and then that causes you to spend more um, on the mandatory side of the budget, Congress, that, that's good from a congressional standpoint because we lived within the budget caps, but we actually ended up spending more. So there are a whole lot of things that are, that, are, that are messed up. And it's been hard, I think, to make serious progress on thinking about how to improve some of the, the, these incentives in a period where everyone was talking about the system being out of control financially, and, and, and it, just, it, made, it made it much more contentious policy environment over the last 10 or 15 years than, than probably uh, it needed to be. And because of that, I think it was hard for, for anybody to say yes to the kinds of pilots and, and experimentation that, 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 that has been needed. And I'm hoping that in this period where it's pretty clear that there's no fiscal crisis, that if anything numbers are coming down, it'll be possible to work on some of the hard uh, incentive problems. And I think the hardest one is that if you look at the people who are marginal beneficiaries, it's true they got some work capacity, but they don't have a hell of a lot of work capacity. I mean, the potential earnings are sort of like $15,000 a, a year, you know, $18,000 a year on average for the, the marginal DI application, applicants who are the ones who run, you know, who, who if you turn down, uh, they, they can still go back to work. And um, so if you think about interventions that might um, help those folks stay in the labor market, it's hard for them to pay for themselves if the incremental work capacity isn't, isn't that great. And you know, I, I, think, I, I think for many of the folks on the margin, they're actually better off if they can stay in the labor force. I mean, what we offer people who are, who are having chronic health problems, both physical and mental health problems, and sort of you know, not, not well placed in the modern labor market, is sort of right now what we offer them is, uh, here's the deal, if you promise never to work again, we'll give you a lot of money. <laughs> and, uh, or you can sort of m m muddle along. Um, it, it, I, I do think that, th that there are solutions out there that, that probably make the, make the individuals better off by keeping them in the labor force. I, I doubt that they will pay for themselves 
And so it's only if we actually think that the individual's being better off by you know, still have, you know, not, not being socially isolated and not being uh, out of the labor force is, is something we're willing to pay for, that it'll be worth doing these interventions. Um, because just given the, the potential earnings capacity, even with interventions, isn't that high, it's hard, I think it'll be hard to make things you know, completely revenue neutral on that side, and, and we'll have to decide whether, that, you know, whether the benefit of helping people uh, sort of stay on their feet and stay in the labor market is something we're willing to pay for, even if it might be cheaper just to give them lifetime benefits. And so I think that, you know, I think that there's a lot of experimentation to, to, to do in that policy area, in, in that area, uh, and, and I'm hoping we're entering an era where you know, those kind of policy discussions are things that are um, more feasible than they've been, than they've been in, the last, in the last decade.